My, my mother's name, Nancy Hanks Lincoln, and my father's name was, was uh, of course, Lincoln. <laughs> Same as me. <laughs> that makes sense. But you see, I got to have a little fun with this. But it's my way of, of uh, reaching out to particularly the young people that are here. Before I do, before I do anything, for all of you young people that are here, and I speak to each and every one of you, I went from a log cabin all the way to the White House. I have but one year of education, less than 365 days of formal education. Going from that lowly log cabin to the greatest place in the United States. And then because I had the opportunity to do that, I should tell you that each one of you, young people, have that same opportunity that was given to me by the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States. The two greatest documents that were written in this country and I can tell you right this moment, I would, as I have said so many times, I would rather die now than see those two documents destroyed and this country being lost as our forefathers gave it to us in 1776. Here, here. This country cannot be destroyed unless it is from within. No one outside of this country could ever destroy this country. It has to be destroyed from within. And I made that statement in 1837 in a speech that I made in Springfield, Illinois. From within, not from without. We are too strong. We are too great in what we as individuals all believe in. This, this, excuse me, this war that we are in is a terrible thing. And yes, it's one that has to be in order to do what that great Declaration of Independence said. All men are created equal. But it seems that other people have other ideas. And I point to one particular individual who became the Vice President of the Confederacy, Alexander Stevens. Alexander Stevens, in, a, in uh, making a speech, made this statement. The Declaration of Independence was written by white people for white people only. Black people were put on this earth to serve the white man. His words. I don't think that would leave any doubt in your mind that there is no way that the Southern people will ever give up any of their slaves, period. It's not going to be there. That's a terrible thing to say because the Declaration of Independence is very clear. All men are created equal. But if you go on with the Declaration of Independence, we have those inalienable rights freedom, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Liberty has one definition only, freedom, freedom for everyone. There isn't any doubt in my mind of what our forefathers meant when they wrote that Declaration of Independence, when Jefferson wrote, all men are created equal. There isn't any doubt, and I don't think there should be any doubt in your mind if you've read and understand that Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States. The great killing. My main goal in this war is to keep this country together as one country, one single. As I said so clearly in 1863, one nation 
under God, with a new birth of freedom, and a government of the people, because you are the people of this country. You govern yourselves, all of you, collectively, govern this country. This country does not belong, this government does not belong to the President of the United States. It does not belong to the Senate. It does not belong to the House. It belongs to you, each and every one of you. That's what our forefathers gave to us. That's what I want to keep in this country. That's the reason I ran for the presidency. To keep this union together as one, not divided. And to free four million slaves in the process. Politically, that's the leader. But what I have, I have always said, what I do about slavery, I do for my country and because of my country. My personal feelings have nothing to do with it. They never have and they never will. It is always my country comes before any and all people. I see very little of my own family. I see very little of my boys, my young boys. My oldest boy is off at Harvard, but my younger ones are here in the White House. And as, as I, I could tell you a story, how do you, how do you cope with this war, personally and individually? There's one of the ways that I do, the soldiers have a similar way. Humor, laughter, and you think laughter in the midst of thousands and thousands of times, yes, laughter. That's how you cope with it, that's one of the ways. I watched my little boy, Tad, really, for a long time. And I never paid any, really any attention to them. And as, as time went by, I, I, I finally one day I had time. And I, I saw Tad carrying a board, and he went upstairs. And I thought, why? And then I, I followed him. And as he didn't stop in the attic, he went up to the roof. And there on the roof, as I, as I walked up to the roof, on those stairs, there on the top of the White House, they had constructed a full fort. They had a regular fort built up there. And they had a cannon up there. No, not a real one. They had a little log that looked over the edge of the building. And if you were down below, looking up, that was a cannon up there, a black barrel cannon. And yes, you see, you got to have a little laugh, and you can't help but laugh at something like that. And that's what I did. Those boys were my way of getting away from the Civil War for a while. But that's a little bit about me. And uh, questions from you? And questions, yes, young man? I'm sorry? Did I create it? No, I did not. I was helpful in it, but it was not mine. No, it was a collective effort, and, and I became a member of that. Yes, indeed, but that was not me. 